More flexibility in the modeling and BIM arena by allowing for customization of railings and fences using user-defined profiles and parameters. The railing fence provides default settings for railings and posts, but can also utilize custom profiles, allowing for the creation of custom railings and fences. Let's start by taking a look at the basic functionality of this tool. The Railing Fence tool can be found in the Furniture and Fixtures toolset in the Toolsets palette. With the tool active, you'll see several modes in the toolbar. There are two drawing modes. The first mode, Polyline mode, is used to create 2D paths to generate the railing or fence. This mode is polyline based and has all the same vertex modes as the Polyline tool. The second mode is the 3D line mode. This mode allows the railing or fence segments to be drawn along a 3D line. In addition to the two main drawing modes, there's the Railing Fence Tool Preferences button and Symbol Selection pop-up menu. The first step in creating a new railing or fence is to either set specific settings for the railing in the Preferences dialog or choose a predefined railing or fence symbol from the Symbol Selection pop-up menu. We'll go into customizing in more detail later. For now, let's start by placing a simple railing using a predefined symbol. We'll use the Railing Aluminum Horizontal Wire Bars symbol. Using the Polyline mode, with the corner vertex mode active, we can draw straight line segments. The first click starts the path and then continue clicking to create segments. As with any polyline based tool, you can switch between modes while drawing the path to create different vertices. You can use the I shortcut to toggle between these modes while drawing. To end the path and create the railing, just double click. With a few clicks, we have a continuous railing with a mix of straight and curved segments. If we take a closer look at this railing, we do see a few issues. There are a couple of posts fairly close to each other. This is because the railing symbol we chose is set to place posts at a fixed distance and at each corner. To fix this, we can either edit the settings of the railing or edit the positions of the posts directly. For this railing, let's adjust the positions of the posts. With the railing selected, click on the Positions button in the Object Info palette. Here, we can offset the positions of the posts. To fix the issue with the first segment, we need to offset the position of the second and third posts. When you select a post from the list, it will highlight in red in the preview window, making it easy to find and adjust the correct post. With post 3 selected, we can click Edit and set the offset position to negative 800 millimeters. This will move the post 800 millimeters to the left. Now, post 2 is a little too close to post 3. We need to move it to the left slightly as well. Let's set post 2's offset position to negative 500 millimeters. This will move the post 500 millimeters to the left. That looks much better and fixes the first issue. Let's take a look at this other post. It's also very close to a corner post. In this case, we can simply delete this post completely. Using the red highlight as a reference, we can quickly find which post this is and use the delete button to remove it. Finally, let's add an additional post to the curved section. To add a post, you just select the post before or after where you'd like the new post to be placed. Then simply click New and set the offset distance from the selected post. In this case, we can select the post before, post 9, and give it a 100mm offset. Once you've made any needed changes, click OK to save the changes and update the railing. The railing will redraw with the new post positions. In addition to the Position button, there are a few other controls in the Object Info palette. There are multiple display controls for the railing or fence. There's a component pop-up to choose whether or not to show the railing in 2D or 2D and 3D. There are controls for the top rail. You can choose to show or not show the top rail, as well as to end the top rail at post. There are also options to show the 2D view of the posts and the 3D view of the frame. There's also a settings button to edit all options for this railing. Let's make some changes. Here, you can completely customize the railing or fence. This dialog is separated into three sections. On the left, we have the pane section, where you can switch between various parts of the railing or fence. In the middle, all the settings of the selected pane are shown. Then on the right is a preview window. You can choose the desired view and render mode. It's recommended that you use one of the section views. This will speed up the preview update time. Under General, you can choose a predefined symbol. This will apply the settings from the selected symbol. You can also save the current settings as a new symbol for later use. We'll come back to this after we've made a few changes. 
Below this, you have the same component visibility control that we saw on the object info palette, as well as an option to set a default class for the railing or fence. Here, I'm going to create a new class called Railings. Moving on to the top rail pane, you can now choose to show or not show the top rail with this checkbox at the top. This is the same control we saw in the object info palette. Next, we have a profile option. Here, you can choose from round, rectangular, octagon, or custom profile shapes. If one of the default shapes is chosen, either diameter or width and height fields will appear, depending upon the chosen shape. There are multiple predefined custom profiles to choose from. You can also create your own profile symbol. This can be saved in the active document or in your Vectorworks user folder. Let's change this to one of the curved profiles from the default content. Next, we have a height field. Currently, this field is grayed out. That's because the height is being determined by the predefined post symbol set in the post pane. If a default or custom profile shape was chosen instead, this option would allow you to set either a custom height for the top rail or if the height is calculated from the height of the posts. For example, if we switch to the post pane and set the post profile to rectangular and then go back to the top rail, we can now edit the height field. We'll leave this set to custom height for now. The last option in the general pane is top rail ends at post. If a path drawn for a railing or fence exceeds the spacing of the post, this option allows for the railing to stop at the last drawn post. Otherwise, it will extend to the end of the drawn path. This option can be overridden in the post category by enabling the post at starting point and post at end point options. These options will place a post at the end of the drawn path. With these, as well as the post at corner and two posts at corner options enabled, you may see issues like we saw earlier with posts placed close to each other. Let's take a look at the rest of the post options. At the top, you'll see a pop-up window allowing you to choose between no post, post, and wall bracket. No post disables the posts and all options, so we'll start with the post configuration. We already mentioned the first option, 2D view with post. This is found in the object info palette as well. It turns on and off the visibility of the posts in 2D. Next is the post height. Similar to the top rail height, this is only enabled when a standard or custom profile is selected below. If a custom symbol is selected, this field is grayed out because the height is determined by the height of the post geometry in the symbol. When enabled, you have two options just like the top rail height, calculated height, or custom height. As we mentioned earlier, the post height and top rail height fields are connected. If one is set to custom height, the other switches to calculated height. The height of one determines the other. If we set a custom value of 1500, not only does the height of our post increase, but if we switch back to the top rail pane, we see that it has changed to calculated height and is showing the height of the post plus the thickness of the top rail. Next, we have the post profile pop-up. We've mentioned this previously. Here, you can choose from round, rectangular, octagon, custom profile, and custom symbol. As with the top rail, diameter or width and height fields will display with the basic shape options. For custom profile and custom symbol, there are many default symbols to choose from, or you can create your own. This can also be saved in the document or in the user library folder. The profiles are closed 2D shapes, where the symbols are full 3D representations of the posts. Below the post profile options are the fixed post settings. We mentioned these briefly earlier. In addition to choosing to create posts at the start, end, and corners, there are also distance fields to offset the posts from those points. Next, we see the arrangement options. There are three choices, approximate distance, fixed distance, and number of posts. Fixed distance uses the specified distance to arrange the post. Approximate distance uses the specified distance as a guide, but will adjust the spacing if needed to avoid placing posts close to each other. Number of posts simply distributes the set number of posts between the start and end of the railing or fence path. Let's change this to approximate distance for now. You also have access to the position dialog we went through earlier. The last options in the post configuration are for fascia mount posts. If enabled, you can set which side the fascia is on, as well as the height and distance for the fascia mount. That's it for the post configuration. Let's switch this to a wall bracket. You can see we have a different set of options. This configuration is used if the railing will be attached to a wall. In the post pane, you can control the 2D visibility of the post and the overhang. Under bracket post, you can choose which side the wall is on. 
the profile shape for the bracket, as well as diameter, height, and distance of the bracket. Similar to posts, you can also choose whether or not to create fixed brackets at the start and end, as well as place two brackets at corners. There are similar arrangement options for the bracket too. In addition to the new settings in the post pane when the wall bracket is chosen, there are also different options in the top rail pane. There are now extensions for inclined top rail options. For both the top and end of the rail, you can choose from horizontal or sloping and set the length. For this railing, we're going to keep a post configuration, so we'll change it back under the post pane. Let's move on to the frame and panel pane. To start, here you have a few visibility options. You can choose whether to show the frame or panel at all. This will create just posts and a top rail. Below that, there's an option to end the frame and panel at the start and end posts. If disabled, the frame or panels will extend past the start and end posts. Also, there's an option to not create a frame or panel at a corner without a post. Next, you can choose the frame type, either frame or panel. For frame, you can choose to create a frame at the top, bottom, and sides. Set the distance to the top rail and floor. You can set the shape to line, flat, round, or rectangular, as well as control the width and height of the shape. The last options for the frame type are the settings for the frame bars. Here, you can choose to create horizontal and vertical frames. You can even rotate the frames by 45 degrees. There are the same shape options for the frame bars as there are for the top, bottom, and side frames. Controls for the thickness, depth, and maximum distances are also available. Now, if we toggle the frame type to panel, we can create a solid panel between the posts. The only options available are distance to top rail, distance to floor, and width. The distance options allow you to offset the top and bottom of the panel, and the width allows for adjustment of the panel's thickness. If we set the distance to top rail and floor to 200, you can see the panel is offset. For this railing, we're going to leave the frame type set to frame, then turn on the top and bottom frame, as well as the create vertical frames options. That's it for the frame and panel settings. Next up, we have the start and end pane. Here, you can set chamfers for the start and end of the railing or fence. This is useful if you're trying to match up separate sections of railing or fence. Just choose the needed angle for the start and end. In the last pane, we can control the attributes of the individual parts of the railing or fence. There are separate controls for the 2D and 3D components, giving you full control. These options can be set directly or by class attribute settings. Before exiting the Railing Fence Settings dialog, let's save this new railing for later use. If you navigate back to the General pane and click the Save as Symbol button, the Save Railing Fence dialog box will appear. Here you can choose to save the symbol in the current document or in a template or library file. If you save the symbol in the current document, you can choose to place the symbol in an existing symbol folder or create a new one. If the Save as Template in Library File option is chosen, a custom defaults file is created in your Vectorworks User Library folder, and the symbol is saved to this file. Symbols saved there will be accessible through the Railing and Fence tool by default in all files from then on. Now that we have our railing saved, let's look at the changes. That looks great. We have one final mode to cover for the Railing and Fence tool. This railing was created using the Polyline mode and created all the posts at the same height. But what if you needed to create the railing or fence on a slope? You need to use the 3D line mode in these cases. This mode will create individual sections of railing or fence. The start and end point can have different Z heights. Let's create a fence along this sloping site model. First, choose a fence symbol. We'll use this one. With the 3D line mode active, we can snap to the edge of the site model here. Click once, then move to the end of the first contour and click a second time to place the first section. Before we place the next section, let's edit the tool preferences and turn off the start post. This way, we will not create two posts at each end. We will also need to uncheck the frame and panel ends at the start and end post option in the frame panel pane. This will make sure that the frame still extends to the start of the path. To start the next section, we'll snap to the bottom midpoint of the end post of the first section, and then snap to the edge of the next contour. You can see this section slopes down slightly. If we look in the Object Info palette, we'll see two new fields, Height Point 1 and Height Point 2. Here you can manually adjust the start and end heights. 
Depending on your slope, you may find you need to create shorter or longer segments. You can also use the position button in the object info palette to adjust the bottom offsets of any posts if needed. Using this mode and the position offset options, you can generate a fence that follows any slope.